Well, Heather, the grand jury goes back to the very founding of our nation and our constitutional underpinnings. Our forefathers, who gave us this great constitution, uh, distrusted the awesome power of government. And one of the protections that they embedded within the Constitution to protect the citizenry from the overreaching power of our government was the grand jury. Uh, the citizens drawn from the community coming in to decide whether uh, a person should be charged with a serious crime, a felony. It's, if you think about it, it's the most basic, concrete manifestation of this ongoing experiment in self-government that we have. The notion of citizens coming in uh, to make this very basic decision of whether somebody should be charged with a crime. It's unique to who we are as a people. It's unique in the world. And when I travel abroad and uh, talk to judges from other countries, they're always intensely interested in this because, as you probably know, in almost every other country, it's the prosecution that decides by itself uh, who should be charged with a crime. But in our country, uh, in order to buffer the power of the government, uh, our forefathers who gave us the Constitution decided to put that between the awesome power of the government and the people, to put the citizens the citizenry in to make those decisions. There are often people um, who criticize oh, the power of the federal government, but it really all starts with regular citizens. It does. Uh, it's the beginning of the process. Uh, the, uh, there'll be investigations, uh, sometimes very lengthy investigations, before the case will be brought to a grand jury, but really the formal part of the proceedings the judicial part of the proceeding starts with the grand jury. Citizens hearing evidence and deciding whether the government has presented sufficient evidence to constitute what we call probable cause to find that first there was a crime that had been committed and secondly that the people who are suspected of having committed these crimes, whether there was probable cause to believe that they had committed them. And it's the citizenry through the grand jury that makes that decision. Why is secrecy so important? Well, any number of reasons, if you can uh, think about all the things that happen in the decision to charge somebody with a crime. First of all, uh, if it were to become public, uh, those who were targets of grand jury investigation uh, might decide to attempt to influence other witnesses, uh, might destroy evidence, uh, might even uh, threaten witnesses, and might flee. So that's one reason for grand jury secrecy. Another very important reason for grand jury secrecy is that when a grand jury begins its investigation, there are any number of people who might fall within the umbrella of suspicion. And ultimately, those people may never be charged with a crime. If it were to become public that the grand jury were looking at them for possible criminal activity, that would be very unfair to those folks because their names would become public and it would be very hard for them to get their reputations back if they were never actually charged. They make a commitment to serve a term of 18 months, six months at a time, and some grand juries have served much more than 18 months. They've been continued over several terms beyond their 18 months, so it's a long-term commitment. And uh, it's, it's a challenge. Uh, when I, as chief judge, impanel a grand jury uh, and I come out and I tell them what the term is, uh, you can imagine that this is not met with an embrace of enthusiasm. Uh, and I have to talk to them about how important their work is and how, it, uh, and how we're able to be flexible, but that nevertheless it's, it's an obligation, a constitutional obligation of citizenship. So uh, I guess in a broad view I would characterize it this way. When folks come in they're not always enthusiastic about the opportunity to serve but by the time they've finished their service um, it's remarkable how many, uh, I wouldn't say it's a hundred percent universal, but it's remarkable how many people uh, tell me that this was although a challenging experience and certainly one that would have uh, you know, brought some inconvenience to their lives and their families' lives, 
uh, how this was really uh, an experience which was one of the most rewarding experiences in their lives and also one which ultimately reassured them about our criminal justice system. The Detroit corruption investigation uh, sort of unfolded over time. Uh, and as the grand jury was investigating, the grand jury uncovered more and more and more potential criminal uh, misconduct uh, on the part of on the part of the leadership uh, of Detroit, but also on the part of people who were contracting with Detroit. And as this happened, it's the grand jury's responsibility to pursue all evidence of criminal wrongdoing, not just that that they're originally charged with. So the Detroit corruption grand jury was a special grand jury. We have two different kinds of grand juries. Maybe I should have started there. We have a regular grand jury which looks into broad general criminal wrongdoing in many different kinds of criminal activities. Um, a special grand jury is uh, impaneled to look into a specific set uh, of criminal misconduct, in this case the Detroit corruption. And it expanded and uh, in order to uh, continue a grand jury, whether a regular or a special, but almost always a special, uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office has to come to me as chief judge and request permission to continue the grand jury past its term. Uh, and I began to get concerned quite candidly when the head of the criminal division would come to me and he would say, Judge, you know, we need to continue them. They've discovered additional wrongdoing or potential wrongdoing and they want to pursue this. And I would say to him, I would say, uh, gee, are, are you sure they're okay? They've been, they've been at this a long time. And he would say, Judge, they're fine. They're fine. Um, so I was concerned when the investigation ended uh, I was concerned that uh, when I went to discharge them, I might hear some, uh, I might hear some uh, complaints about the length of their service and uh, some concerns that reflected not just the inconvenience but the real hardships that the service might have carried for them and their families. It was just the opposite, Heather, just the opposite. Uh, I was so humbled uh, when I discharged them, and I did that right here in this courtroom. Uh, I heard story after story after story about how, although there were hardships for them and for their family, that they believed that they had to see this through, that it was the most important thing they had done, and that they wanted to make sure that they were satisfied first as a judicial body, that they had done everything that they could do to investigate to the end the criminal misconduct that they had seen. They told me that. They also told me, and this was really quite amazing and quite unusual, that when it came time to return the indictment, usually only the foreperson or the foreperson and the deputy go into court and return the indictment, that they felt so strongly about the work that they had done and so strongly about their service that all 23 of them went into the courtroom to return the indictment because they wanted to show how unified they were and how committed they were to their product. Very unusual. I, I don't know of any other, I don't know of any other time when that's happened. Pretty remarkable. It is remarkable. And I, I, I think that the, the citizens of this region and this community uh, should be uh, very grateful to the work that these grand jurors did. Uh, I couldn't help but reflecting upon that when the trial ended and the jury came back with a verdict. I couldn't help but reflecting upon uh, the debt that we all owed to this grand jury that had made so many sacrifices and worked for so long uh, on this investigation. And I asked them about that. You know, I, I said I was worried about you folks. Uh, and they, they came back to me and told me that uh, you know, they were committed to seeing this through. How satisfying is that for you to see on any grand jury the reaction that they have once they're finished with the service? It's a reaffirmation of the wisdom of our forefathers and our constitutional system. Uh, I take great pride in that as a judge. I've had the 
the privilege of representing our federal judiciary in conferences and uh, meetings with judges from all over the world. And uh, it's, I think it make, it, it's something that makes us unique. It's something that all Americans should be proud of uh, because this really is the most basic concrete manifestation of this experiment, this continuing experiment in a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And I'll tell you this, sometimes when I, when I travel abroad and I meet with judges from other countries, particularly those countries that, uh, that don't have a culture of self-government and citizen involvement in government, I'm met with skepticism. <laughs> they often think that you know the judges are up there, and this is true not only of the grand jury process but the trial jury process. They often think that the judges are up there pulling the strings and telling the grand jurors or the jurors what what to do and what the result should be. And I always try very hard to disabuse them of that in, in a nice way, invite them here to come and. Uh, observe our proceedings and uh, I think it's something that all Americans should just be very very proud of we're the only country that conducts a grand jury process the way we do it uh, inserting the citizenship between the government and the people uh, at the most basic part of the process the beginning what do you think is the biggest misconception about the grand jury system I think the biggest misconception is that the grand jury is just a rubber stamp for the prosecution. Um, certainly, uh, there, the great, great, great percentage of cases that are brought by the government to the grand jury end up in indictment. But what people don't see along the way is the involvement of the grand jury in the process itself, bringing in more witnesses, uh, not charging on some charges that the government is urging. Uh, telling the government it, they require more evidence before they're prepared to indict. So I think the greatest misconception is that the grand jury is somehow a rubber stamp for the prosecution. Uh, it's not. I mean, uh, any judge who's been involved in the grand jury process will tell you that grand jurors are very involved in the investigative process and that they hold the prosecution uh, to its proofs. Our grand jurors are very robust. In, uh, in questioning witnesses, in reviewing documents, and telling agents and prosecutors that they want more evidence. The grand jury process reflects who we are as a people and our values. Uh, it reflects, going back to the revolution, our distrust of government overreaching. Uh, it reflects our confidence in the citizenry to make these decisions, di difficult decisions, and the trust that we repose in our government, in the citizenry. Uh, it's remarkable that uh, we have a constitutional system which reposes so much authority in the citizenry itself. Prior to trial in a criminal case, uh, in making that very basic and important decision of who to charge with a crime and what charges should be brought, and then at trial, in deciding whether the government has met its burden of proving somebody guilty beyond a reasonable doubt.